Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us as we open our hearts, as we share, as we pray, as we listen to scriptures, as the gift of the Spirit is given to the gathered community, whether we're here or online today, especially today with the breeze. It's, it's nice a little bit with the fans because of the heat. Yesterday I was uh, speaking to a man who was telling me about, um, we were talking about God and the gift of the Spirit, and he said, it's kind of like the air around you. You don't feel it until there's a breeze. And you're like, oh, okay, well, so today it, I thought of him as we were speaking about uh, and thinking about the Holy Spirit coming and feeling that within our hearts. Today we continue the sermon series about uh, feeling connected, feeling home, and whatever home means for each of us and whatever home needs to be for us. And the sub-theme is that of the universe. Home is the place where we belong with our authentic selves, with who we are, with who God created us to be. And so this week, we're focusing on the human race and thinking of that invitation to consider our belonging in this family of God's creation, of being human. Now, when you hear this statement, I am only human, what comes to your mind? What was that? I'm just a person. Like, you know, I'm flawed. I'm not always, you know, perfect. I don't always get it right. Uh, but the other side of being human is that we are created in the image of God, and we forget that. In the story of creation, one of the major affirmations that gets repeated by God is that everything was good. Whenever God looked at whatever was created, it was good. And so uh, today the invitation is to consider that goodness. 
It doesn't deny that we are imperfect, that we do fall short, that we are flawed, but also it affirms the importance of claiming who we are being made in the image of God. And so here's the scripture that um, I, the book of Psalms is full of these amazing affirmations of life. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them responsible for the works of your hands. You have put all things at their feet. And so uh, it's an invitation to remember the goodness of God's creation in and through us and to embrace that mystery that despite all the flaws and the, sometimes the mess-ups and the sins and all the things that we do to each other, there is an essence of goodness that God has placed in our hearts. And that's why goodness always resonates within us and with us a lot more than the evil works of, of uh, humanity. And so I want to share with you a brief video, and this is a reflection from Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan priest and writer and, and uh, theologian. And he talks about this invitation of not being afraid. For so many years we've talked about the problem of evil. They call it theodicy, the problem of evil. How do you account for the existence of the Holocaust, the inquisitions, the uh, genocides in human history? But I have to say, you could equally speak of the problem of good. And I just constantly meet people that their goodness is unexplainable. You just want to shake them and say, why are you forgiving? Why are you so, where did that come from, you know? What kind of being are you that your parents kicked you around and you're still? I mean, that's why Grace is in the title of three of my books. It's just the most amazing thing to me is this phenomenon that we name as Grace, this unbelievable positive energy that emerges out of nowhere. <laughs> I think we begin with original blessing, uh, the book of Genesis says God created it and it was good. God created it and it was good. We start on a foundation of original goodness, not original curse. And I'm afraid we made it into a huge problem. And even Jesus became a problem solver, not a revealer of the mystery of the heart of God. So it got us off to a negative beginning, a problem solving beginning. The, the best scripture scholars have taken all the passages that say, fear God. They say, you look at the Psalms and the whole context. The word fear would have been translated in the Latin Bibles as pietas. The filial love of a loving son toward a father that he loves and doesn't want to disappoint him. That is a kind of fear. I don't want to disappoint dad, but it's not that I'm afraid of dad. It's just I worship dad and I don't want to let him down. That's a different quality of fear. And that makes sense. Someone you really, really admire and love and want to please. So it's filial fear, awe before one that you admire. And that's a different texture of fear. It's not this craven fear that's fear of punishment. It's fear of not pleasing the one I love. But here's the sad thing. Many of the people who fight death the most are deeply religious people because their image of God is so toxic, so punitive, so fearful. And I've heard that from uh, I've met half a dozen hospice workers now, that many of the people they have to work with the most on the day of their dying is people who've been intensely religious all their life. And what's kept them religious is fear of God, not love of God. They haven't really fallen into the mercy yet. And so they're still recounting their sins. And I mean, we're all gonna be doing that knowing how unworthy we still are. So if you haven't fallen into the mercy, death must be a terribly scary thing for a religious person. And all I can believe is that it breaks the heart of God, that God created us with such potential for love. 
and we sure have abused it. Uh, we just, you know, even, even Christianity is not really about love, it's about laws. And almost everybody finds out they haven't obeyed the laws, and so they give up and think they're outside the circle. And so today the invitation is to embrace that goodness, embrace the image of God in the human race, and to claim it and ask God to help us to live each and every day with that. So I invite you to uh, take a deep breath and prepare your hearts for worship as we uh, share in the gathering prayer, and this is a translation of the Lord's Prayer from New Zealand. O oh, most compassionate life giver, may we work with you to establish your new order of justice, peace, and love. And help us through forgiving others to accept forgiveness. That we may resist all evil. Please uh, join me in singing the first hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing. Uh, it's hymn number 150. For our gratitude moment today, we am sharing with you uh, the video. It was sent out in the email, and I know some of you might have watched it, but this is about uh, the building use and all the different activities that happen in the church building. And so this is a reflection from David Blake on uh, just the month of June. June has been an incredibly busy month. Uh, we started off on the 1st of June, the very first day, with the glow-out 
uh, block party, which was incredibly well attended. Uh, ice cream truck and all kinds of things. Um, we always have our normal functions going on with the knitters on Tuesday and centering prayer on Thursday. Um, the drop-in center for the kids at 3.15 on Thursday. Um, again, this month being very busy, we had uh, on Saturday the 8th, the Glow Out uh, Block Parade. And uh, Crossroads was in here for a training that same day from 9.30 to 2.30. Um, we had Mindful Mondays on Monday night the 10th and the 15th was the, uh, this past Saturday, was the little free pantry giveaway, which uh, Jen said was incredibly well attended. Uh, that, that went from 5 till 7 or after. And at the same time, a little bit earlier that day, Melzi had her spring recital. Um, so that's just getting us up to date. Um, starting tomorrow the 19th, uh, there's a baby shower in the fellowship hall. And uh, then next week, uh, in addition to Mickey's normal fourth Monday social respite program, uh, we're sponsoring the Mexican Consulate Mobile uh, Outreach, uh, a fellow by the name of Luis Jimenez is coming in and he'll be here all week. Um, to meet with people in this community uh, or the whole area uh, related to uh, citizenship uh, through the Mexican consulate. Um, so we have all, all kinds of things going on in the month of June. Uh, it's always a, a busy time, uh, always trying to figure out who's going to open, who's going to close, are they going to be done by a certain time. Uh, we recently changed the closing time from 10 o'clock to 8.30 at night uh, because so often somehow the church wasn't getting locked up and I was losing good friends like uh, Doug Danerzewski and Brian Bromstead and uh, Steve Mountain, Bob Shepard, you know, and they would get these calls after 10 o'clock at night to come down and lock up. So. We're, we're working on a lot of things to improve that, and we're thankful that the building is being used, and uh, it seems to be a real resource, um, and we're not even talking about uh, how grateful the volunteers for animals were as well, so it, it's a wonderful thing that we're doing for this community. As we were... I was, I was sitting and listening to it, and I've watched it a couple of times before. Uh, what came to my mind is, are two people, uh, Kay Federley. Kay, how many years did you do building new stuff and locking up and getting called at night? 150. 150 years! <laughs> what, would, what would happen at night? Well, just at night, you'd get a call from the police sometimes, and you know. And your heart drops. You're yeah. like, oh, say, what happened? Oh, what's happening? And then yeah. I'd just come in and lock up. Right. Because it got overlooked somehow. Right. So thank <laughs> you. Miss it. And you don't miss it. Yes. And Don Iwanaki, Don, how many years did you do the building use? It was given to him as punishment. <laughs> penance, penance. But it's really neat to see people continuing this, this ministry and really upping it. Uh, because now, I mean, we used to have building use, but really every week now it's so many different pieces. And poor Melzi, sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work out perfectly. Well, what happened last week, the week before? You were sitting here giving a lesson, yep. and then the police show up, you know, because somebody, someone who I think from Crossroads House came in, and even though they were told not to punch in the code, they did, and it set off the alarm, and Melzi got the joy of having to tell the police everything is fine. Uh, <laughs> But you can see this uh, ministry, and, and I love that it's in the spirit of the generosity of the church that it is helping the community because these groups wouldn't have any other resource in many ways. So we give thanks to God.
I invite you at this time to share any prayers of joy or concern that you may have. Uh, if you'd like to share something, please raise your hand. I want to begin by giving thanks for the life of our beloved sister in Christ, Mary Chua, who entered eternal life on Friday evening. And so um, I'm not sure what the details of the celebration of life will be, but it's looking like it'll be this week, this coming week. So uh, giving thanks for her life and her witness. And she was one of those people who did so much also in the life of the church. If you had asked her, how many years did you do the church decorations? She would have told you 150 years. Um, Charlene, how many years did she actually do that? Do you, you don't know, but it was a long, long time. The flowers and you know, all the stuff. She, she, I mean, that was just one of the many things that she contributed to our community. So we give thanks to God for her life. Any other prayers of joy or concern? I've been trying to figure out how to say this, but <laughs> it's been many weeks that I've asked for prayers for my sister. And as you, most of you know, her um, diagnosis was benign as of this past Monday. So she does not have pancreatic cancer. She just has a scar that she needs to get better and her body needs to get better but she, has no, she doesn't need any treatment. So I thank you all very, very much for the prayers for my sister. And we continue to pray, pray for my niece, Janetta. So giving thanks for Wendy's recovery and for continuing to pray for Janetta. Yes. I would just like to say thank you to everybody for making this New adventure, so exciting and fun and wonderful. Seeing everybody again and having to spend, getting to spend time with them and not rushing in and running, rushing out. Thank you, Rula. Yes, we're so glad. Uh, I keep seeing, every time I see Melinda, hey, attending anything, I'm like, oh, you're here, oh, you're here. I, I'm not used to it because usually since I've been here, you've been gone. And so it's been wonderful to have you with us and contribute and continue to, I mean, you've always kept up with us and contributed and helped and prayed, but to see you physically here is a, is a gift. Oh, they've enjoyed having you at Crossroads House. Anything else? Uh, just continued prayers for Wayne. He's, uh, his infection is healing well. He's still on IV antibiotics, but he's improving, so that's good. So continued prayers, yes, for Wayne, but giving thanks that he is improving. Did, did I hear somebody in the choir? No? We have a new baby, yes. How could I forget that? I was uh, so excited. You know, I knew uh, Valerie uh, stevens Bachensky went into labor yesterday. And in the evening, I'm like, wow, how come I haven't heard? Of course, you know, first baby, long labor. But uh, the baby arrived, and his name is Ronan Martin Bochinski. So they combined different parts of their grandmother's names and great-grandmothers, and so they, they put all of that together for this cute little baby boy. So we give thanks to God for Ronan's life and arrival here, and I'm sure you will get to meet him at some point as he is part of this congregation already. And so, any other prayers? Okay, and let us continue in prayer. God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the gift of coming together as your people to worship, to pray, to bring our hearts together. We give you thanks for Mary Chua and her witness here. Uh, to your love and her commitments and all that she did for uh, the church, but also for her family and community. We pray for her family as they mourn her loss, for all of her friends, for those who will be uh, missing her presence in this life. But 
give us such faith and trust that we will get reunited one of these days with our beloved Mary. God, we give you thanks for the gift of new life with Ronan and ask for blessings on him and his family and for his faith as he uh, continues to grow up uh, knowing that he is made in your image. God, we give you thanks for the different joys and concerns that we have shared and uh, especially pray for those who are struggling uh, with treatments, with surgeries, recovery, uh, any people that are going through a hard time in the world as well, who are in areas of war, of famine, of natural disaster. Uh, we give you thanks for faith and the gift of your people coming to help each other. And so we ask that we may live by this wisdom of your creation, of your vision for us, as we saw it in the experiences of our ancestors of faith, but also in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we come before you in a few moments of silence to bring our hearts before you in our own way. We continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught the disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
And so today, as we look at this theme, I think of the whole challenge of looking at the chaos of our world and the different challenges that we face. Just to think of a few situations, uh, thinking of Russia and Ukraine, thinking of Israel and Palestine. These are the big conflicts of our world, but you can see also, even within our own families, within our own communities, there are times when you question the goodness of God's creation, when you see that sometimes in your own heart, in your own motivations, sometimes in the losses uh, that we experience, there is this whole question, yet... In all of it, there is that also the deep connection, even in all the different pieces that we may uh, think are out of control or that show us that evil has taken over. There is still a lot of goodness in the world, and that's why goodness always resonates with us more than anything else. Even though evil or bad news, they get our attention for sure. I mean, most people would click on a news story if there's bad news in it than good news because that's our instinct. But it's not an instinct just because we are drawn to evil. It's because it's not the norm in life when you think about it. People love each other. People care for their families. People try to do the best they can. Even the people that are doing bad things, they're often motivated by good thoughts. You know, they think they're doing the right thing. Even, uh, you know, listening, I don't know if you ever read any of the transcripts or listen to Putin. His motivation in his mind is good. We don't agree with it. But his mind is that, you know, I'm fighting the West and all the corruption of the West and nobody cares about our people. Our people are neglected. So I'm doing this to help a cause. Uh, same could be seen in people in your life. When you have problems with them, what, what do they usually say to you? Usually they're saying, you know, it's because I'm defending myself or if I, f I feel like I'm defending my children or somebody that they're worried about. They're usually there is some logic, flawed as it may be, there is some logic to it in their minds. But underneath it all, there is this universal connection. And one of the practices, especially early on in the pandemic, when the world seemed to just come to that horrible place, remember those feelings that you had when the pandemic hit and it felt so hopeless? And at the same, around the same time, we started getting these incredible images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Any of you have seen some of those pictures or kept up with what's happening? And I love that it keeps continuing to give us new perspectives and new information on things that uh, people didn't know, science didn't know. Um, so I want to share with you a short video of some of those images and let that resonate with you in whatever way it needs to. And uh, I'm going to invite you to reflect on that.
reactions? Y yes? It puts things in perspective. Puts things in perspective of life, of the magnitude of God's creation, the beauty. I love the beauty. Paul, did you have something to say? Looks pretty beautiful, yes, breathtaking. There is so much in it. But to think of that, that is, that's, that's our home. That's where we are, and we are a small part, yet we are a part of this magnificent creation. And, and to think of that connection to, the, to God's universe, I love the words of Psalm 19, uh, where it says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Put that in perspective with these images. The heavens are telling the glory of God. This was before they had a telescope and all of that fancy stuff to look at creation, but they could just see it with their own eyes. They can feel it. The night sky, people for all of time have relied on the night sky for inspiration, but also for navigation for understanding their place, where they are in the world, and what's going on. And so it's, a, it's an incredible gift for us to put the human race in this perspective, to remember, never lose sight of where you are. So whatever problem you're facing right now, whatever challenge you're facing, remember, this is all part of the goodness of God's creation, even though it may seem like it is the end of the world. It never is. And so these images remind us of the cosmic story and of our part, and I think of our part in them as, as human beings. Um, they take you out of that place of seeing life just in small ways to larger perspective. Yesterday at the Wild, the wild Church at Godfrey's Pond, somebody took an incredible picture um, by the way, Elaine, if you thought I took that picture of the uh, mushroom, it wasn't me. Uh, we always joke because somehow Mark and Elaine always get these artistic, beautiful uh, photos. But somebody, uh, they weren't there, but somebody took your place yesterday and took this incredible picture. Uh, it was Craig Kunkel and his wife. They took a picture of this mushroom. And I said, well, what's your secret? They said, oh, we took this class on taking pictures of mushrooms. I said, seriously, there is such a class. Okay, I said, well, give me like one hint. What would be, you know, something we could do? And he said, the best thing is you put your phone or your camera on the ground with the camera down and take a picture of the mushroom. And then you'll see, and it had the pond behind it. It was an incredible picture. And again, thinking of this small little thing, it, insignificant, most of us would be just walking by, not even paying attention. But putting it in that perspective just changed everything. So if you haven't seen that image, it is on Facebook. If you'd like me to text it to you, I'd be happy to. It's just an incredible uh, gift of seeing things from a different perspective where there's that uh, connection. Another metaphor uh, for all of this, for the connection to all of life, is something called the butterfly effect. This is from the chaos uh, theory. Now, chaos theory is, is basically, the way I understand it, non-scientific understanding, but the gist of it is that you can't predict the future completely because there are so many uh, unknowns, and anything could change anything. And so, basically, uh, the image is that if a butterfly flapped its wings in Beijing, the following week, there would be a tornado in Kansas. So meaning that it, one little thing could be, I mean, this is, of course, a total exaggeration, but the idea is that we're all connected and all of life is connected. And sometimes a small thing insignificant in one place could lead to so many uh, different possibilities. And we know it in our own lives. You know, someone does an act of kindness that has a ripple effect on so many people and leads to a change of heart. You could, you could see it sometimes in, in the kindness of a stranger uh, where there might be a, a tension, a time of tension, and they just make you laugh and then the whole mood changes because somebody took that energy. 
And so the invitation is to remember that we belong here, and each of us has an important part in, is in, this, in the unfolding of God's cosmic story. So even though it might be little, and you may think it's insignificant, it is part of what God brought us here on earth to do. And so how do we become at home with this understanding and becomes second nature for us? So the answer that Jesus gave, I believe, is, is found in Luke 17. And so here are the Pharisees coming to ask Jesus. Now, Pharisees uh, were a group of religious teachers that really uh, wanted to follow all the laws and believed that if you kept all the laws, then there would be uh, transformation and there would be salvation. And so they, they had issues with Jesus. They struggled because he kind of went outside the, the norms of what they were expecting. And so they are asking him, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, because Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of God. And going around, even, you know, when you think of many of the teachings, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So think of the perspective shift for the people. Because they were wanting things to be changed. Uh, history needed to have a big cosmic event to happen to get rid of the Roman Empire to change the circumstances of life. Have you had those prayers in your life where you said, God, please change this whole situation? Time for confession. It's okay. It's good for the soul. To say, yeah, there are times when we say, you know, God, I don't want this. I don't like any of this. And we pray for it to all change, but we forget that sometimes the change is about us accepting what is and it's about trusting God to lead us in those in those tough times it may not change the circumstances but prayer does change the circumstances of our heart and I'm not saying that sometimes that the circumstances don't change because sometimes they do but we don't always understand the big picture of life. All we have is this stuff in front of us. And so to remember the connection to others, to remember the importance of community, to remember the, the power of love, the gifts that are small, sometimes is all that we have. And that is somehow enough because the kingdom of God is within our grasp. The kingdom of God is not going to come in this big magnificent event. Sometimes we long for that, but the kingdom of God is more powerful than that. It is subtle. You know, when you think about, I always think of, uh, if you've seen water changing direction or changing the land over time, you know, when you think about it, just a little bit of water over time, it could just change so much. And I feel like that's the power. The energy of love is that way. That's how God changes things. And that was hard for people because they wanted Jesus to be what? The Messiah that would come and conquer and change things right away. Even after he died, they wanted the, his second coming to happen right away. Why? Why do we do stuff like this? Why do we want things to change right away? Impatience, the truth is that we're not patient. We don't want to be living through tough times. Hey, you know, enough is enough. We've suffered enough. Uh, but we don't have the full picture of life. And the work is to trust one step at a time, one relationship at a time, one encounter at a time, one thought, even for ourselves. I was speaking to a person after this, the first service, and she was sharing about her struggles, even inwardly. She said, sometimes I feel disconnected from myself. There's an emptiness within me, and I want to grow somehow to find what really fills my heart. Because most of the time, think about it, we're told to live this exterior life. It's all about what is out there. 
but rarely do we get taught to spend time in that interior place, in that place where the kingdom of God is at hand. And so the invitation is to look at this whole story of the human race. And if you are fed up with the world the way it is, do the work, the hard work of love, even if it seems not important, if it, even if it seems like it's not going to make a huge difference. Don't ever lose sight of the importance of every little encounter or every little thought that you have about other people, whether it's judgment or hate or fear, to keep that perspective in place. I want to share with you a quote from Barbara Brown Taylor. She said, every morning when you wake up, decide to live the life God has given you, to live right now. Re refuse to live yesterday over and over again. Any of you do that yesterday stuff? Yeah? So refuse to live yesterday over and over again. Resist the temptation to save your best self for tomorrow. That's another thing. We think, you know, it's going to be better in a week. We don't know what the next week is going to bring. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. It's right here, right now. Live a caught-up life, not a put-off life, so that wherever you are, you are ready for God. Ours may be the generation that finally sees him ride in on the clouds, or we may meet him the same way generations before us have, one by one, as each of us closes our eyes for the last time. Either way, our lives are in God's hands. So the connections to all of life, to the human race, this, this experience being at home in this human life is about refusing to believe in the cynical and evil forces of the world and to focus our energy on the ways of love, on the path of Jesus and his teachings and example and his spirit of love. I know it sounds very simple, yet I know how hard it is because we're always aspiring for what we don't have. We're, we're never satisfied in the places where we are. We have this angst and think, you know, it's just going to be better once things get sorted out. If I could just get the clutter under control in my house. Or it could be as, as important as if, if my loved one just gets to be better. Whatever it is, it could be a, a, as serious as a war ending, but it, it could also be as simple as taking time to nourish your spirit. So every thought, every act is part of that big picture of the universe. It's part of that unfolding story. I want to end with this. And Don, you'd, uh, you should thank Sophia for this ending because I had a story to end uh, with. And uh, my daughter sent me this from Instagram. And so I thought, I'll share it with you. I, I think it's simple, yet it's powerful. It said, hurt people hurt others, but luckily, healed people heal others. Safe people shelter others. Free spirits free others. Enlightened people illuminate others. And love always wins. So shine your light of love on all who may cross your path in life, because what you do matters. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will always be with you. And when you fail, when you don't live in this gift of love, call the place of home into that moment. Amen. And so we will end with uh, hymn number 367, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love.
and the blessing is from Macrina Weidricker. May you believe the truth about yourself, no matter how beautiful it is. May you believe in your power to transform indifference into love. May you believe that you have an amazing gift to keep hope alive in the face of despair. May you believe that you have the remarkable skill of deleting bitterness from your life. May you believe in your budding potential to live with a nonviolent heart. May you believe that you have the strength of will to be peace in a world of violence. May you believe in your miraculous capacity for unconditional love. May you believe the truth about yourself, no matter how beautiful it is, because you are an essential part of the unfolding story of God's love for our ever-evolving universe, now and forevermore. Amen. Please turn to your neighbors and greet them with the peace of Christ. Thank you.